Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling Podcast. For countless parents, the journey to unschooling has redefined childhood and transformed their family relationships. Are you curious? Together, let's explore what living and learning looks like without school. Hello, explorers. I'm Pamela Riccia, and this is episode number 237 of the podcast. It's the 5th of August, 2020, as I record this intro. This week, I'm sharing part six of the audiobook edition of my book, The Unschooling Journey, A Field Guide. Inspired by Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey framework, The Unschooling Journey is a weave of myths, contemporary stories, and tales for my journey. It's not a how-to book. No two paths through the world of unschooling have the same twists and turns. Yet, having a general sense of where you are on your journey can bring valuable insight as you navigate the challenges that will inevitably appear. I share this book as a field guide to the stages and characters you are likely to encounter in some form on your unschooling journey. So last week, we covered stages 10, 11, and 12, ultimately reaching the holy grail of our quest, unschooling with confidence and grace. Let's do a quick review to set the stage for the final leg of our journey. In stage 10, accepting others where they are, we ask ourselves, who still holds power over us? Why do we continue to engage with them on the seesaw of resisting their control and seeking their approval? What grows out of this deep personal exploration around our need for approval is a feeling of freedom to show up openly as ourselves, mistakes and all, doing our best. As we continue to embrace this new level of self-awareness, we no longer feel the need to hide or apologize for our choices, nor are we drawn to flaunt them. We just live them. In stage 11, cultivating kindness and compassion, we reach the apotheosis of our journey, which for me was all about finding the magic in the mess. As we contemplate what we've learned about judgment, temptation, and power over the last three stages of our journey, our understanding continues to grow, and in this stage, we glimpse the true nature of life. As we continue to heal from our past, old fears and hurts fall away, and their influence on our choices today fades. As that weight lifts, we feel lighter and more open, able to find more creative and fun ways to navigate our days. As our self-awareness grows, we bring more of our true selves into our days. And as we learn more about our children, our connection with them deepens and our trust grows. These revelations feed off each other, bringing an increasing lightness and depth to our days. And in time, we realize we are approaching the summit of our journey. We find ourselves able to reach for kindness and compassion more often. And in my experience, so often when we choose to reach for kindness and compassion in the moment, we discover magic. The moment turns and we find ourselves going places more interesting, more fun and more meaningful than we could have predicted or even imagined. In stage 12, unschooling with confidence and grace, we obtain the holy grail of our quest. We are truly and deeply unschooling. In myths and stories, the reward at the end of the journey is often represented by an object, fire, magical trinkets, priceless treasure, or elixirs of health or immortality. But after the trials and tribulations of our journey, the real reward isn't material. We have journeyed to attain the grace of the gods and goddesses. Not to steal it from them, nor to trick them into giving it to us. It's not a fixed commodity but to come to understand and therefore share their perspective and their spirit, their grace. The real prize we've gained is the knowledge of our indestructibility in life. It's that understanding deep in our bones that enables us to move through whatever challenges life throws at us. Grace is the kindness and compassion that comes from knowing that we will endure, that there is a light at the end of the tunnel even if we can't quite see it yet. And remember, having grace doesn't mean we are perfect. There will be challenges that seem insurmountable. There will be temptations. 
In fact, understanding that we aren't perfect is an integral part of our journey. We learn ever more deeply that unschooling, that life is a practice. Each day, each moment, we can choose to reach for love, kindness, and compassion, to live gracefully with others. So that's where we left off last week at the summit of our journey. And in this final episode, we enter the last phase of our journey, living unschooling. The unknown world we set out to discover now feels like home. And with our quest accomplished, we're enjoying the fruits of our labor. Maybe for a while we think we're done, (laughs) but there is so much more to explore and learn. And at some point, we'll choose to begin our journey back to the ordinary world. And as we wrap up, I want to make special mention of the incredible illustrations included in the book by the amazing Hema Bardwatch. I love them so much. And Hema, an unschooling mom herself, joined me on the podcast when the book first came out to talk about the inspiration behind the images and share some delightful stories about her own unschooling journey. Our conversation ended up being almost two hours, so I broke it into two podcast episodes, 114 and 115. So I really encourage you to listen to them. And if you'd like to see the illustrations we're talking about, I included them in the episode transcript. So you'll find all the links in the episode show notes. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast side quest, diving into the unschooling journey through the lens of the hero's journey. And for listeners who prefer interview style episodes for the last week, I've selected episode 27, 10 questions with Teresa Graham Brett, which was first released in July of 2016. Teresa is an unschooling mom with two kids, and she's the author of a wonderful book, Parenting for Social Change. Teresa's background as a social justice educator brings a unique and interesting slant to her journey to unschooling. In this episode, she shares some great stories and the fascinating insights that she has gleaned along the way. Of course, the journey never ends. We're always learning, right? And in that vein, we talk about adultism, the conventional obsession with control over children, ways to move to more supportive parenting, and so much more. You'll find the link to that episode in the show notes as well, or just search your favorite podcast app for episode 27. As a personal update, Lissy arrived this week. (laughs) She's doing her two weeks of quarantine, and we're having fun catching up, albeit without any close contact. I see a very big hug in our near future. (laughs) And before we get to this last installment of the book, I want to take a moment to thank everyone who has chosen to support the podcast through Patreon. And a big welcome to new patron, Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. I deeply appreciate all my patrons. Your generous support not only lets me know that you enjoy the show and want it to continue, it allows me to spend time creating episodes each week and to keep the podcast archive freely available to anyone who's curious and wants to explore the fascinating world of unschooling. If you'd like to join my community of patrons and scoop up some great rewards along the way, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash exploring unschooling. And now let's dive into part six of my book, The Unschooling Journey, A Field Guide. Living Unschooling Stage 13 The Trek Back When the Ordinary World Calls After choosing to accept the call to adventure, we have spent a lot of time and effort on this unschooling journey of personal exploration, learning, and growth. The unknown world we set out to discover now feels like home. And with our quest accomplished, it's time to enjoy the fruits of our labor. We see our kids making solid choices, exploring their boundaries, and learning like crazy. We love spending time with them, sometimes deeply focused and in the flow of an activity, sometimes relaxed and laughing, enjoying their company, and other times commiserating and consoling and validating their frustration and sadness. It's living as a full-contact sport, energizing and tiring and beautiful. 
refusing to return. Yet, it's here that we might begin to stagnate. Life feels wonderfully satisfying in our unschooling bubble. Safe. The bubble has been so incredibly helpful as we navigated the de-schooling phase of our journey. It gave us the time and space we needed to observe and contemplate how real learning happens, to better understand ourselves and our children, and to explore ways to live together as a family. And now that our unschooling lives are flowing reasonably smoothly, it can be tempting to stay in the warm embrace of our new comfort zone. Maybe it's mostly our home. Maybe it includes regular gatherings with the local unschooling community, park days or gym days. Maybe it includes the library and the rec center. Eventually, though, as our family continues to explore and learn and grow, it's likely that we'll start to bump up against the edges of our bubble. There are interesting things in the ordinary world. When that happens, the thought of returning to the challenges you left behind can be intimidating. Maybe you're worried about your children experiencing the judgment of others more directly. Maybe you're wondering if you'll get caught up in the rush of busyness again and feel pressured to prove to others that unschooling is a good choice for your family. We are reminded of all the questions and challenges we've worked through to get to this point. Will our newly won wisdom sustain us in the swirl of the conventional world? Not only that, the process often isn't as simple as just stepping back out, as many hero stories attest. This return phase of the journey can be as intricate as our departure into the world of unschooling was. We'll need to figure out ways to reintegrate with the ordinary world that work for our family. Maybe we're feeling excited to share with others what we've learned on our unschooling journey. Maybe we're happy to concentrate on living our unschooling lives. Our responsibility is first and foremost to our family, what works for us as individuals. So the question to consider at this stage is whether or not our unschooling bubble continues to be a supportive and helpful feature in our journey landscape. If it's still an integral part of our lives, we will refuse to step out, at least for now. The key is to pay attention to when it starts to feel constricting. Is anyone starting to feel like they're wilting? rather than growing? There are other journeys, other mysterious worlds to be explored, but they'll wait until we're ready. And we'll soon discover that we can retreat and cocoon in our unschooling bubble whenever we feel the need to recharge. Bringing back the gift of unschooling. Once we've chosen to begin our return journey back to the ordinary world, it can take many forms. Sometimes we may feel like we're bringing back this amazing secret with us. Our lives are so much more joyful now, and we want to tell anyone who will listen. There are many tales in which the hero, having triumphed and won the reward, wants to quickly bring it back to the world for the betterment of humanity. For example, there are many stories surrounding the discovery of fire, like the Native American Creek tale, How Rabbit Brought Fire to the People. In the beginning, there was no fire, and when winter came, the people were cold. They knew that the weasels on the island had fire because they could see the smoke rising, and they wanted some to keep warm. The people asked the animals how they might get some, and Rabbit was the only one brave enough to try. He explained that every night the weasels build a big fire and dance around it, and he could join them and steal some fire. Rabbit put together his clever plan, and before he swam to the island under the cover of darkness, he rubbed his head with pine tar, making his hair stand up. That night, he joined the weasels dancing around the fire, and as the dancing got faster and faster, Rabbit bowed his head deeply near the fire. As he planned, the pine tar in his hair caught fire, and he quickly ran away. The weasels chased him, but he was too quick. They watched from the shore as Rabbit swam back, his head ablaze. The weasels called on the Thunderbirds to make it rain and put the fire out, but clever Rabbit hid in a hollow tree until the rain had passed. And that is how Rabbit brought fire to the people. Rabbits appear in folktales around the world, often as tricksters, like in this tale where Rabbit tricked the weasels to steal some fire from them. 
Did you hear stories of Peter Rabbit growing up? He seemed to always manage to escape Mr. McGregor's clutches. Or watch Bugs Bunny cartoons? Bugs always got the best of Elmer Fudd when he was hunting rabbits. And at this point in our journey, we too might feel a bit of the trickster energy, like we're getting away with something by not doing what everyone else is doing. The myths surrounding the discovery of fire are apt for this stage as well. In stories, fire often represents knowledge and warmth and spirituality, our inner light. A campfire invites people to gather, cooking food and telling stories. And if we feel like we're bringing back the gift of unschooling to the world, we may want to share our stories and experiences with others. Maybe we choose to more actively answer questions in online unschooling groups, or host playtimes or coffee chats with other unschoolers in our home, or organize campouts or even conferences. Modern versions of hanging out around the campfire and sharing stories. Making a fresh start. Another way our return journey may play out is by inspiring us to make a fresh start. We may find the conventional world giving us a rather hostile reception, as if we've done something wrong. They probably weren't very vocal about it while we were cocooning, busily exploring and learning about unschooling, but that can change as we return and more actively engage with the ordinary world. You may find family or neighbors dropping by regularly and maybe even inadvertently belittling you and your children. With people quizzing your children and questioning you, you may be left feeling inadequate, and it can take hours or even days for everyone to recover their joyful, unschooling momentum. In other words, sometimes there are people in the ordinary world who don't want you to bring your funky new lifestyle and ideas into their bubble of conventional society, so much so that they will actively lash out at you. In this case, if you find you or anyone in your family feeling unsafe, you may choose to escape to safety. Maybe the flight is more metaphorical as you choose to actively distance yourself from discouraging family and friends, but some unschoolers do physically move away to distance themselves from negative environments. This may be a difficult decision to make. I can also imagine the incredible sense of relief and joy and adventure an unschooling family might feel when they choose to move to a new community, a fresh start to go hand in hand with their new perspective on learning and living. When the ordinary world comes knocking. Yet another way our return journey may begin is by being pulled back to the ordinary world by others. We have done a lot of personal soul searching and paradigm shifting work to reach the summit of our unschooling journey and obtain our reward, and we may want time to rejuvenate. And then there's a knock at the door. It may be friends or family asking to get together. Maybe we've been avoiding social gatherings for a while, almost automatically replying with a gracious no thanks. But we can take a moment to honestly consider it. Maybe the thought doesn't seem so daunting anymore. We can ask our spouse, our children, what do they think? In another interesting unschooling twist, maybe it's our child knocking from the inside, looking out to the wider world. Be sure to listen for it. My children loved the unschooling cocoon we created for many months, but eventually, feeling safe and secure with their home base, They began looking to follow their interests beyond the embrace of our family. Lissy found girl guides, Michael wanted to explore karate, and Joseph wanted to expand his gaming world online, connecting with other players around the world. Of course, not all at the same time, when they were ready. It's important to watch out for whether we continue to cling to our unschooling bubble to the detriment of our children's exploration of the world. Sure, we can bring lots of the world to them, but when they are interested in venturing out, we want to support that too. And something else to consider. It can be tempting to seek out and favor unschooling, or at least homeschooling, communities when looking for opportunities for our children. Sure, we hope to find a more comfortable environment surrounded by families with similar perspectives on learning, but that doesn't mean our children's personalities and level of interest are going to mesh well with the group. We may find a homeschooling guide or scout troop or homeschooling rec classes 
or a server full of unschooling gamers, and it's great to try them out. But don't expect that things will go smoothly just because the other children don't go to school either. Our children aren't usually looking to connect with others over unschooling. That's our interest. Just as kids in a school classroom don't find being local and the same age, very fertile ground for friendship. People, children, and adults enjoy connecting and engaging with others around their interests. The interest itself is the key parameter, not the lifestyle of the other participants. So be open to trying out several different environments for a particular activity to find one that meshes well with your child. Whether the outside world comes knocking or your child is keen to begin exploring beyond your doorstep, the key to choosing when to begin the return phase of your unschooling journey is to be aware and attentive. Stage 14, Crossing the Return Threshold. Integrating our newfound perspective into everyday life. No matter the motivation behind your return, as you step across the threshold back into the ordinary world, you may not quite know what to expect. Our perspective on daily life has changed since we began our journey, as have our relationships with our children, not to mention the joy that infuses much of our days. We may find some people are taken aback by us, a bit confused by our hands-on approach to living, the zest for life that can often seem to ooze out of even our older children. They may be a bit resentful of how much fun we're having and how happy and easygoing our relationships seem. Don't we know life is hard? In the sense that they mean it, yes, we do. And therein lies one of the interesting challenges of our return. Using the language of the ordinary world. As we move more and more into the ordinary world, we can sometimes struggle to express our newfound perspective in words that others will understand. It can also be challenging sometimes to get into the flow of a conversation. Questions posed to us are often phrased for yes or no answers. In groups, we're expected to pronounce good and bad judgments quickly and in alignment with conventional wisdom. To do otherwise marks us as different. At the same time, we recall how these opposites are not exclusive but complementary. We see the wholeness and real-life experience that dynamically flows between those poles. But how might we express that in a mundane conversation about whether or not our child is allowed to call us from camp? Finding the right words can be surprisingly difficult. And how might we describe our multifaceted lives in the more black and white terms that others will understand? While we describe our children as choosing what they want to learn, most people see children who never want to learn anything. Why the discrepancy? Because in their worldview, the only learning topics that count are those in an approved curriculum, and the only way to learn is to be taught by someone, preferably a teacher. So much of the learning that we see, they dismiss outright. In fact, they probably see children actively avoiding learning. When we say that we don't have bedtimes, they envision chaos and crankiness. And from their perspective, if they were to just drop the rules and leave their kids to their own devices, which is what they're thinking we're suggesting, there's a good chance they would find themselves in exactly the spot they fear. We are using familiar words to describe our lives, but they have a richness to them that we discovered on our unschooling journey. This richness is invisible when viewed through conventional filters. Where they see anarchy and parents leaving their children to flounder and fail, we see strong and connected relationships and parents actively supporting their children as they explore the world. What they don't see is our active and engaged presence. They don't see parents and children living together as trusted and respected individuals. And why would they? That's not the conventional family environment they would expect. We've just completed a long and sometimes challenging journey to understand and appreciate the unschooling way of life. It's likely they have not. It's valuable to realize that our words are interpreted by others through the lens of their life experience. 
They aren't wrong. It is their truth. The Tao De Ching Legend says that when Lao Tzu was 80 years old, usually dated around the 6th century BCE, he decided to seek solitude. Riding a water buffalo, he eventually arrived at the western border of China. The chief guard recognized him and asked that he write down his wisdom and teachings before he left. Lao Tzu agreed, returning a few days later with the short text that would eventually become known as the Tao De Ching. Roughly translated as the Way of Virtue Book, or just the Way, one of its central themes is the interconnectedness of all things expressed through the principles of yin and yang. It encourages the development of self-awareness to understand human nature and the interconnectedness of all people, leading to a strong sense of being in the world. And interestingly, even though it was written more than 2,000 years ago, Lao Tzu begins his work by explaining the challenge of using everyday language to try to describe metaphysical concepts and questions. The language obstacle isn't new. One of the many well-known quotes from the Tao Te Ching is, Simplicity, patience, compassion. These three are your greatest treasures. Simple in actions and thoughts, you return to the source of being. Patient with both friends and enemies, you accord with the way things are. Compassionate towards yourself, you reconcile all beings in the world. See how well that connects with what we've been learning on our journey? So much of what we've discovered as we live and learn with our children is about being human in our world. Simplicity in actions and thoughts is possible when we understand ourselves so well that who we want to be in our thoughts and who we are in our actions are in alignment. When we are patient with both friends and enemies, we can meet them where they are, like with our language conundrum. And when we are compassionate toward ourselves, we see the wholeness and interconnectedness of all beings and treat them with kindness. Simplicity, patience, compassion. These are some of the gifts of the hero's journey. Making choices in the everyday. So why are we returning to the ordinary world? to expand our horizons and our children's. The world is a wondrous place. There are people who share our interests, people who know things that we would love to know, and people who have skills we would love to learn. So often they are happy to share their knowledge with anyone who is interested. And when there's a shared interest, the importance of age fades. At the dojo that Michael attends, there is a wide range of ages at all belt levels, and they train together. When Lissy volunteered at the animal shelter thrift store, she made a wonderful connection with a retiree around costumes and photography. Lissy ended up visiting her home to borrow some amazing clothes and props for shoots and was regaled with wonderful stories. And for Joseph, age is not obvious online in games and forums. Knowledge and skill come to the forefront. As we go about our days, when people realize our children don't go to school, what we bring to the world is the knowledge that the conventional wisdom around learning and parenting isn't the only way. That seed is planted inside every person we encounter, no matter how that particular moment unfolds. We exist. And if or when they are ready to consider what our children's joyful lives might say about their understanding of learning and education and parenting, they'll do so. At some point, they may even become curious enough to ask us questions. They might be hearing the first faint calls of their own call to unschooling. I've had a few occasions when a parent at Michael's Dojo knew we were homeschooling and asked me a few questions. I find those conversations so invigorating. They stretch my mind and my skills as I try to meet the person where they are and find the words that will connect with them there and with that connection made, find more words to take them to where I think they want to go. Because so often the question they ask isn't exactly what they want to know. It's that language thing again. For example, when they ask, do you give them tests? Often what they really want to know is, how do you know they're learning? 
So instead of giving them an in-depth rundown of the legalities of reporting, I might reply, no, I don't. Tests are useful in classrooms because teachers have 30 odd kids and it's the most efficient way to see what they know. But at home, I only have three kids and I hang out with them all the time. They ask me questions so I know what they're thinking about and I help them find answers. I hear them using new words and conversations and sharing new ideas. I see them using new skills. I don't need to test them because I see their learning in action. I get to meet the other parent where their experience is in school and then walk with them into my home where unschooling lives. And since they're ready to ask questions, often they're ready to hear the answers. Their eyes light up with understanding and they excitedly ask the next question and the next. A few times, Though both of us had been on our way out after dropping our kids off, we found ourselves in the lounge at the back of the dojo chatting animatedly until class was over. Another seed planted. It's also helpful to remember that just as conventional isn't synonymous with right, unschooling isn't necessarily a good match for every family. What's truly valuable is knowing there is a choice. When we feel forced to do things, so often we do them reluctantly, without much consideration or effort. It's like we give our power away. But when we choose to do things, we are more engaged and thoughtful in our actions. Even if school is a part of a family's lives, it needn't be their master. If they take the time to consider it and choose not to give the system that power. School is not the work of childhood. Knowing that they are free to choose the environment in which their children learn will encourage people to consider their unique family's needs and explore what works best for them. These worlds, unschooling and ordinary, are illustrative, not literal. Returning to the conventional world isn't about converting or convincing others to join us. It's about integrating our unschooling lives into our ordinary world. In Lao Tzu's terms, it's about living the way in our daily lives. Unschooling is living. Stage 15. Being ourselves in the world. Finding the beautiful in the mundane. In the last two stages, we've talked a lot about the two worlds, the unschooling, unconventional world and the ordinary, conventional world, and how we're working to knit them together. Joseph Campbell calls this stage master of the two worlds. It is the master's ability to pass back and forth freely between them. We certainly find ourselves spending time in both. Sometimes we choose to spend time in the ordinary world with its conventional perspective and expectations. And other times we're immersed in our unschooling world, hanging out at home or with other unschooling families. As we continue to pass back and forth, we gain more and more skill with the transition. Mastering the Transition Between Worlds One thing I found helpful, especially before going places with a more conventional atmosphere and expectations, was to talk with my children before we went. They appreciated knowing what to expect, so they didn't feel out of the loop. I'd let them know if there was a schedule to things, what the rules and expectations were, who else was going to be there, and so on. For example, if we were going to the Science Center, we'd look up the live shows that were available that day and see if there were any we'd like to try to catch. We'd talk about how we might need to leave an exhibit to get there in time to get a seat and how we could go back to it after. I'd ask if there were any exhibits they wanted to be sure to visit, and we'd put them first in our plans. I'd also mention if we were meeting up with anyone else, so they knew if we might be waiting in the lobby for a bit before heading in. We'd talk about how busy it might be, depending on whether it was school trip season and how the students usually left by 3 p.m., giving us less busy time later. Or, if it was September, how it was likely to be much less busy. Knowing we'd be staying together, we might bring something for them to play with if one of them was done with an exhibit while the others were still occupied. These prep plans and conversations would only take a minute or two in the flow of our day, maybe the morning of the visit or a couple of days earlier, depending on the child's preference. And then after we got back, 
or maybe on the drive home, we talk about what went well, any hiccups we encountered, and how we might approach or avoid them next time. Those tidbits come up naturally as we chatted about the visit. Maybe the electricity demonstration was lots of fun and they want to be sure to go again next time. Maybe we waited too long before breaking for lunch, so we had some cranky moments and we decide to eat a snack just before we leave next time. Same for visits with extended family. If there was going to be a meal at a certain time and snacking beforehand was frowned upon, I'd let them know what the plan was. I'd explain that I'd let them know when the meal was almost ready, and then when we were there, I'd help them transition from their play to the table. We'd chat about who was going to be there, so there were few surprises or disappointments. And for me, I'd be sure to have a few conversation starters handy for chatting with the other adults, like asking about their favorite TV show, and ways to object if things started to go off the rails, like the trusty pass the bean dip, please, we talked about earlier. I enjoyed asking questions about their interests and what they've enjoyed doing lately. People who are passionate about something are often a lot of fun to listen to. And sometimes when they answered that they weren't really interested in anything, the question still served to plant the seed that following our interests has value. I'd also bring toys and games so the kids had fun things to do. And if the adults were willing to join them, it was a more relaxed and fun way to enjoy each other's company. For example, we'd bring bingo to my in-laws because it was a game we enjoyed that extended family were likely to join us to play. Either way, I was happy to play with the kids. It meant we were having fun and staying out of the way. I'd share some ideas with the kids too. Graham's just got back from vacation. We can ask her about her trip. Or after lunch, we can ask Grandpa if he wants to play Crazy Eights. He likes to play that with you. I've called my mom before a visit to let her know that the kids are really into a certain game at the moment and ask if she'd be interested in playing with them. If so, we'd bring it. If not, I'd let the kids know and we'd come up with something else to do. Navigating the transition between our unschooling world and the ordinary world doesn't mean we are different people. We can be ourselves in both worlds. But this planning time helped things go more smoothly and be more fun. It was also a great way for us to learn more about each other's needs, as well as the constraints, peculiarities, and customs of the places we were going and the people we were with. The Pars learn to live in both worlds. Have you seen the film The Incredibles? At the beginning of the film, we are introduced to the Parr family. Bob Parr, a.k.a. Mr. Incredible, was a superhero back in the day before an avalanche of lawsuits against superheroes forced them all into retirement and full-time ordinary lives. Talk about constraints. We meet Bob now, 15 years later, looking much older and working in a corporate cubicle at an insurance company. Ever the hero at heart, he surreptitiously helps an old woman to get her claim approved but his boss finds out and berates him for not keeping the company's best interests first and foremost. Next, we meet his wife, Helen Parr, a.k.a. Elastigirl, as she arrives at the principal's office for a meeting regarding their 10-year-old son, Dash. Dash is being disruptive in class. Again. And though he escapes punishment, it's clear he's using his superhero speed to pull pranks in class. Talking to his mom after, he reminds her that if he could just go out for sports, he'd be happy. His mom reminds him that the world just wants him to fit in, and he'd be too tempted to use his powers to win. Then we meet their 14-year-old daughter, Violet Parr. She watches a boy she has a crush on walk by, but when he turns around to look at her, she's disappeared. Literally. When they all come home for dinner that night, it's clear that they are having a hard time being supers and suppressing that side of themselves to live full-time in the ordinary world. Bob is not engaged with his family and misses his old life, and Dash and Violet would rather not have their powers if they can't use them. And now, let's skip to the end of the film, after they've undergone the bulk of their hero's journey. Mr. Incredible has learned that he loves his family deeply and being with them has been his greatest adventure. And the family has learned that together they are a powerful superhero team that can defeat the villain. 
After a three-month time skip, we learn how well the pars are doing now that they're able to live freely in both worlds. Dash is on the track team and, with his family cheering him on from the stands, races to a close second in the 100-yard dash. Violet, running into her crush in the stands, doesn't shy away. Instead, she arranges a movie date with him. And when, at the end of the day, the new villain appears at the stadium, the family dons their masks, ready to save humanity again as the Incredibles. They are now able to move comfortably between their two worlds, their two identities, happy with who they are in both. The Spirit of the Everyday One of the challenges at this stage of our journey is that we can get caught up in thinking of our unschooling world as more meaningful and the conventional world as more banal. As I began venturing more regularly out and about, I had a tendency to see unschooling as my inner world, not really surprising after having sparked such an intense inner journey, and the conventional world as my outer world. This meant that I saw my inner world as more meaningful and my outer world as more banal. But just as the Parr family discovered that their lives in the ordinary world are as integral a part of themselves as their superhero lives, we too can find that wholeness. As I explored the crossover between my inner and outer worlds more deeply, I found ways to bring my inner perspective into my outer world interactions, and I was amazed at how different things looked. I realized my views on life and living had changed so fundamentally that it changed how I approach every moment in both worlds. Everything seems both more mundane and more wonderful. Here's an example. Something as mundane as tidying up a room is no longer a philosophical struggle against what else I could be doing with my time. Nor do I worry about what message it might send to the kids. With no expectations of ourselves or others, I finally felt free to choose. And in that freedom, I discovered that, for me, the choice is really about possibilities. What might unfold on the fresh canvas of a tidy room? Newly invigorated children's play? Relaxed adult conversation? Engaged family play with adults and children sharing the stage? A rest on the couch with tea and a story? And to boost the fun factor, since I was no longer feeling put upon and grumbling, sometimes I might listen to music or audiobooks or podcasts. Other times, I'd quietly let my thoughts wander, feeling almost meditative in the repetitive physical motions. Or I may decide to take a nap instead, knowing that a messy room is filled with past joy and that the Lego village might inspire another bout of play before it's set aside. In these moments, living in two worlds, I found joy, both in the moment and in future possibilities. I was delighted to find the spiritual world mingling easily with the physical world. It turns out the everyday tasks of life are not frustratingly mundane. There is such beauty in them when I'm open to it. Let's try another example, the other way this time, starting with something that sits at the spiritual core of unschooling, learning. With unschooling, we have come to realize that there is learning in everything our children do. As we watch our children in action, we can practically see their minds at work, the sparks of connections flashing across their face as they try out different pieces of the puzzle, searching out that one piece that will so satisfyingly fall into place. Yet, if we look at that moment through conventional eyes, we see that they are just doing a puzzle. At the heart of one of the most beautiful and spiritual tasks of being human, learning, so often lies the most ordinary of things. A puzzle, an insect, a TV show, a star in the sky. Passing back and forth between my inner and outer worlds no longer seems so intimidating. In fact, these worlds enhance each other. We feel so much lighter free to stretch ourselves and explore beyond our comfort zones, while at other times to say no without judging either choice. Both are what worked for us in the moment. Moving beyond our expectations and fears, we can more clearly see ourselves, our children, and our choices. 
We realize now that when a challenge arises, it's not about giving in or giving up, but about releasing our need to control things, allowing us to start fresh and be open to the many possibilities that are truly present in each moment. We can hold on for the ride. And that brings us full circle to the stories above. The possibilities that are opened up by our seemingly tedious tasks, like tidying a room. The possibilities for play and learning and joy that are inherent in the most ordinary things. Now when we look around, we see possibilities everywhere. With our newfound perspective, we see both the beauty in our physical world and the ordinary in our spiritual world. It's all so compelling, and soon we find ourselves comfortably flowing between them. We have moved beyond yet another pair of opposites to wholeness, though this time at a different level. These two worlds truly are one world, full of possibilities. Stage 16, The Flow of Our Unschooling Lives Living and Learning and Growing One of the most fundamental insights I've had on my unschooling journey is that we, children and adults alike, are always growing and changing. We see it in our children, and as our self-awareness grows, we recognize it in ourselves as well. We are not what we have been led to believe. Children are not just adults in the making, and adults are not finished. We are growing and changing, living and learning, being and becoming. This constancy of change seems to be a foundational idea about the human experience, regardless of the era in which you live. Before we embarked on our unschooling journey, being told that change is constant probably sparked a sinking feeling in your gut, indicative of a generalized fear or worry about the future. Oh no, what's going to happen next? We so often assume the worst. But as we come to appreciate change as our lifelong bedfellow, We soon recognize it everywhere. It is the sparkle of possibilities. It feels like a weight has been lifted and we are able to appreciate the moment. Living our bliss. This refreshing perspective frees us up to fully engage in our lives. Even challenging moments feel less paralyzing because we realize their transience. Able to breathe, we can more easily find that moment, that beat, between action and reaction, where we can see the bigger picture and use it to light our path, to see the possibilities. Campbell calls this stage freedom to live, and rightly so. Almost paradoxically, our ability to fully live in each moment grows as we stop holding on to it so tightly. We know in the depths of our soul that life flows through both calm and turbulent waters, Sometimes we're the rock being polished, and sometimes we're the leaf bobbing on the surface. We can be both, whatever the circumstances call us to be. And what's even more beautiful is that we begin to recognize this flow of life in others. We more clearly see the stage they are at on their journeys. We feel less judgmental and more compassionate. Their choices, their actions and reactions say more about where they are on their journey than they do about us and ours. Our journeys are our own. This is so freeing when we're out and about. We can be ourselves. Our upbeat attitude carries a spark of our joy into the ordinary world. When you and your family are out and about, you are a shining example, even without words, that there are possibilities and perspectives that lie outside the conventional life. Over the years, so many people have come up to me and the kids to comment on how whenever they see us, we always seem to be smiling. People we don't know, but who frequented the same places we did. And it's not because our lives are somehow easier. It's because of how we inhabit our lives. What are the fundamental characteristics we've developed or strengthened on our unschooling journey that help us embrace the joyful flow of life? I think these are some of the valuable ones. We're comfortable in our skin, regardless of how others see us. We're comfortable making choices and open to where they may lead. Because we aren't attached to the outcome, no expectations, 
Our sense of self isn't riding on what happens next. We feel centered. We can be ourselves. We're patient, giving things time to unfold. We know there may be possibilities we have yet to envision. We know we will always have more to learn. Things will go awry. We will change and grow. Our entire unschooling journey can be summed up in these five words. Unschooling is learning is living. And that living is trusting and engaged, aware and patient, kind and compassionate. That is the flow of our unschooling lives. Author's note, living and learning and growing. Phew, I almost can't believe we're here. The journey of this book has taken three years. As I mentioned in the introduction, it began in January 2015 as a series of blog posts about my unschooling experiences through the lens of the hero's journey. Six months later, the series was done, yet I could not stop thinking about it. Rather than satisfying my curiosity, it fed it until it had grown into an all-out passion, and I needed more. I began to envision a book. I was keen to go back and revisit the stages, knowing now what I'd figured out by getting to the end of the series. I wanted to weave in story examples to create more possibilities for connection and deeper understanding, which entailed many delightful hours of research and reading. And then, in mid-2016, I came across and connected deeply with Hema's art. As part of my research, I had found many illustrations of the hero's journey, And soon, I could not shake the idea of illustrating the unschooling journey. I reached out to Hema, and we soon began a delightful side quest to explore ways to do that in her beautifully whimsical and intricate style. And then, more thoughts began weaving through my mind. Like, this is not a how-to book. No two paths to unschooling take the same twists and turns. There's a lot of personal contemplation and processing involved as we explore and integrate these ideas into our lives. And that I wanted us, writer and reader, to take this journey together. I wasn't trying to create a top-down teacher-student relationship, but to cultivate a conversation between us. It was at about this point that I began envisioning the print edition of the book as a journal, with coloring pages for contemplation, line pages for writing down thoughts, and even blank pages for doodling and sketching. Inspiration grew as I recalled my family's love for the book Dragonology, the Complete Book of Dragons, which was edited by Dugald Steer. Dragonology is a beautifully illustrated book presented as a journal of famed dragonologist Dr. Ernest Drake, containing all the knowledge he managed to gather about these rare and secretive beasts. I got goosebumps as I imagined a journal filled with your own experiences and flourishes, making it uniquely yours. That means that each print copy of the book out in the world will be different from every other one. How cool is that? I know how helpful it has been for me on my journey to look back on my thoughts from weeks, months, and even years earlier. I was reminded of insights I had gleaned but soon lost track of, maybe in a recent swirl of busyness. And I came across questions I had been asking myself just a few months earlier to which I now had solid answers. When I sometimes felt like I was barely treading water, a look back reminded me of the learning and growing that was slowly but surely happening. Often, it was just the ticket to re-energize me. Maybe you'll find that too. What I've discovered through this project is that while the book is finally done, (laughs) my fascination with the unschooling journey is as strong as ever. As is so often the case, when our story begins, what we want and what we need are two very different things. When I began my unschooling journey, what I wanted was to learn how to create an unschooling learning environment for my children that would replace school. What I needed was to learn and grow as a person so I could create a fulfilling life that included my children as equal and whole human beings. It turns out that the essence of the hero's journey is about the exploration of what it means to be human. 
It's important that the journeys we choose to take feel meaningful to us. Those who undertake a journey from a sense of obligation will mostly be going through the motions. When we freely choose our path, our sense of self grows as we move forward. We discover that no experience is a waste of our time, that the challenges, the crises, and the transitions we find ourselves navigating all have value as we process and integrate them into our understanding of ourselves, our children, and our world. Joseph Campbell talks about finding your bliss and following it. Not because that is what will be easy, but because that is what will be meaningful to you. Which means you will tenaciously fight your way through the tricksters, the monsters, and the many other obstacles you'll encounter on the journey to get to the kindness, compassion, and grace that lies ahead on your path. The unschooling journey is a splendid example of a hero's journey that can be deeply meaningful for those who choose to embrace it. I am honored that you invited me along as an ally on your journey. Thank you. And remember, have fun. I hope you found this episode helpful on your unschooling journey. And be sure to check out the wonderful archive of earlier podcast episodes. The conversations never go out of date. And you can find more information about my books, my Patreon community, and the Childhood Redefined Unschooling Summit at my website, livingjoyfully.ca. Have a great day.